This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. Every week we bring you conversations with authors about the books and research and other things that we like. And if you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. Some of you have been doing this for months and years and we cannot thank you enough. This episode is produced in partnership with the Jacob Robinson Institute for the History of Individual and Collective Rights at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. My guest today is a PhD student at the Freie Universität in Berlin and a doctoral fellow at the Robinson Institute, specializing in the theory and history of human rights. The provisional title of her dissertation that is currently in preparation is The Non-Identical of Human Rights, The Individual and the Concept of Dignity in Human Rights After 1945. Anna Rettman, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, great to be here. So in your research, you focus on the contribution of two scholars to the evolution of the concept of human rights. One is Theodor Adorno, the fated philosopher and critic, and the other is Franz Rudolf Binnenfeld, an Austrian Jewish legal scholar who headed the British section of the World Jewish Congress in the 1940s. Um, how do these two men shed light on your understanding of human rights? Yeah, this is uh, a very good question. So um, the initial um, idea when I started this project and focusing on the contribution of critical theory and Adorno on uh, the human rights discourse, I was looking on the drafting process of the human rights declaration, which happened uh, between 46 and uh, 48. And I came across with uh, Franz Rudolf Bienfeld, and it, he made a very interesting points about um, uh, human rights, and they need to be more concrete and need a kind of benchmark, uh, not to be arbitrary concept. And um, he was not only engaged in the World Jewish Congress and uh, as a representative of the World Jewish Congress, um, but he also wrote an own book, in, which was published in '47, called Rediscovery of Justice, and where he pushed forward the idea of humanity and dignity and said that it's uh, the main focus of human rights is uh, to establish conditions that uh, a human being is capable to speak for himself or herself. And Adorno, which is not very famous for engaging in legal or political thinking, I think even here in Israel, it's not really known and not really read here in Israel. And when he is read, then more in aesthetic questions but even in Germany as well. So I started to read a little bit more about his so works on maturity and education to maturity. And so these two persons met in this point. Okay, let's take all of this uh, uh, one by one. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack here. So let, let's start uh, with uh, Bienenfeld. You said that before uh, he came on board, the... Um, idea of human rights was abstract and he was looking to put it in more concrete terms. Can you um, explain the evolution of uh, um, human rights and Bienenfeld's contribution in this respect? Yes, yeah, so if we have a look on uh, the idea of human rights, it's not a, a new idea after 45. No? It uh, has its tradition a long time ago. You can go back to the American Revolution, to the French Revolution, and, and the concept of dignity is not nothing new. But after 45, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a process of juridification of human rights started 
Although the Declaration of 48 was not legally binding, it was the first time that the concept of dignity became a legal concept. It was not only in the proclamation um, part, but it was part of the, uh, the Article 1 of the Declaration. And so the whole process of developing this draft of the Human Rights Declaration, the World Jewish Congress was one of the first non-governmental organizations who had the possibilities in the UN forum to comment on these uh, articles and here um, Beanfeld was very active and he commented especially on the article on the right to asylum, the right to education and the right not uh, to be arbitrary. Disenfranchised? Dis disenfranchised, mm -hmm. exactly. So these were the main um, uh, contribution he did. Mm -hmm. He was one of a gallery of Jewish jurists working at that period in the immediate post-war era in the realm of international law, this, you know, incipient um, field of international law. How would you place him as opposed to uh, other similar men with similar uh, backgrounds? The really interesting thing is that his whole career, he was not only a political engaged um, a Jewish lawyer, but he always tried to be engaged in legal theory. So his book, Rediscovery of Justice, which was published in 47, 1947, here he tried to develop a new concept of law and uh, he, he came back to Freud's thinking, because he was studying with Freud in the 20s, and he tried to use some of his concept of uh, psychoanalysis to apply to, to law. And this is very interesting because you have huge struggles in the 20s between the areas of politics and law and how they intersect to each other. And um, what he said and what he was writing and what his main motivation to, to use psychoanalysis or some concept of psychoanalysis to apply for a uh, question of uh, legal interest was that he said that there must be the narrow thinking that uh, law is only dominated by politics or interest is shortcoming because law in itself has something that is goes beyond the only like state interest or political interest and that is what he wanted to push forward it's not only prohibitions but that laws enabling people to get more freedom and and how influential was uh, rediscovery of justice you said it, it was published in 1947 a few months, maybe a year before the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, how, how did the two interact? What was really his place in, the, in this? Uh... This is very interesting. Uh, when I went here in Jerusalem to the Central uh, Zionist Archive, I found a lot of documents between correspondence in the uh, World Jewish Congress. So the first group, I think, who read this book was the World Jewish Congress and different sections and different offices. And he always wrote to these people, ah, you should read this and this uh, um, chapter because it could be very interesting for you. And in the legal theory context, in the academic world, I would say it's it's a marginal figure. Eh? It's interesting that Albert Ehrenzweig um, posthumously published his works. It was in the end of the 60s and it's in the Berkeley uh, Law Library. You can f still find these documents. And then it's very interesting. There are um, some from the legal school of realism in the United States. They read him, but they saw him at kind of dangerous, that it would be a danger for American democracy because he be becomes very pessimistic in his last chapter. Jerome Fra uh, Frank, for example, said this. And then... The pessimistic, how? Pessimistic because he was saying that uh, we need a minimum bill of human rights, not a maximum. And I think this is interesting. He's not overstretching the concept of human rights. He always sees the limits but in the limits and the focus on the individual, through this focus, they can develop force and strength. So is this what you meant by uh, him putting it into concrete terms? This very uh, sense of aiming low rather than aiming high makes it more... A, a more pragmatic approach? Yeah, I would say in this sense, yeah, it's pragmatic in a way, but it's struggling with the real social forces, of course, no? Like, uh, how is it possible? And here, 
we intersect with, with the thoughts of Adorno. How is it possible to hold on the idea of a self-responsible um, person in current social harsh conditions, which is really make it difficult for a lot of people to speak for themselves? Huh? Mm. So he was always tr uh, struggling on the, hand, on the one hand with these universal issues, society and the individual, And um, he was a very interesting uh, person in, uh, in exile in Great Britain. He was a director of an uh, exile organization of um, Austrian Jews. It's called the Jakob Ehrlich uh, Society. And it was uh, different than the Free Austrian, uh, Austrian Movement, which was also an uh, exiled organization, mainly dominated by communists, and a lot of Jewish people um, were there engaged as well. The difference was that the Jakob Ehrlich Society has like three main tasks. It was restitution after the, uh, after the war, then establishing good relations with the Jews in Great Britain and the general um, population. And on the other hand, uh, it, he was very much engaged in um, strengthening Zionist movements. So Bienfeld always tried to combine Zionism and the, the need to have a kind of collective nationhood who can defend uh, human rights. And on the other hand, he insisted that human rights in itself should focus more on the individual and not on the collective. Yeah, so, so he, just like many others of his generation, I mean, I'm thinking mainly about uh, James Leffler's book, yeah, uh, Ruthless uh, Cosmopolitan, that was uh, uh, really uh, um, set the tone of, of the research in, in, in that field. He was a uh, guest here on the, the podcast a few years ago. Um, that all of them, and I want to ask you whether it's the same for Bienenfeld, had this in, um, dual approach to Zionism. On the one hand, they were very supportive of having collective rights and national rights. And at the same time, they were diasporic in the sense that ensuring uh, the rights of minorities and Jews, etc., was also important outside of the Jewish state before and after its uh, establishment. Now, It seems to me that in Binnenfeld's case, because you're saying his insistence on individual rights as well as collective rights, or maybe beyond collective rights, places him in the latter camp more, saying that you know he's more diasporic in his understanding because of his insistence on individual rights rather than collective rights, or maybe uh, to, to a certain extent. Um, is that a fair interpretation? Yes, in a way, yes. But I think what he's distinguishing is what are the conditions of human rights? And then we're coming to we need kind of a collective institutional framework. This is Zionism in a way, in, in this sense, when we are uh, talking in these categories. And the subject of human rights. And the subject of human rights for Bienfeld is really the individual. And maybe I can explain it a little bit more in detail because after 48 there came a huge development in the human rights discourse themselves and for example in the 60s when the two conventions were um, proclaimed the convention on civic and political rights and the convention on political culture and social rights that were um, both of them were legally binding that dignity uh, was not mentioned anymore in article 1 but collective self-determination. And this has to do with all the process of decolonizations in these years. And these discussions are interesting because when a collective self-determination was named in the Article 1, the former colonial states, they pushed forward to put this in, in, in a human rights um, convention. But, for example, there were voices who said this could be dangerous if we put a collective element in human rights that could counteract the idea of human rights. And so, especially, um, there were dissidents from Egypt who said, okay, if we put this in, in Article 1, then NASA can make a silence, our voice silence. And you have these whole discussions on should the collective really be part of human rights or not, no? Or is it then overstretching the concept? And I want to go to Adorno and ask you whether the uh, combination of the two of Binnenfeld and Adorno 
uh, was uh, a leap of faith on your part. I mean, how uh, natural was uh, considering the two on the same, on this very topic? Yeah, this is always a little bit the challenge if you work in an interdisciplinary way. You know, I'm not an historian. I come from philosophical background, especially from critical theory. And here's not only Adorno important, it's like, Uh, Max Horkheimer, uh, Franz Neumann is very important because um, he developed more political theory. So yeah, it's a challenge to focus on the one hand on historical aspects and then do the, I don't know, the combination with philosophical uh, discussions on, on these concepts. Critical theory did it always. And for me, it opened a lot of doors and how can we think about current situations, current problems, to combine people who have the same idea. That, and I would say all the uh, protagonists in my PhD have the same benchmark. And there's a question, how can we assure certain freedom, a certain security for the individual in society? So I think this is a unique something where they have something in common so you can discuss it. And being felt is is this person who combines both because of his practical, really legal engagement in human rights discourses in the U, uh, United Nations context. Adorno didn't have this. He was very uh, in academia. But Hannah Arendt, for example, is another protagonist who's not considered in critical theory, but I think it's uh, worth reading her in this context as well. She always combined this as well, personal political engagement with her philosophical uh, thinking and thoughts. Yeah. So how useful is uh, uh, Adorno's work? I mean, especially his concept of, of critique. What, what is really your uh, political interpretation of Adorno's mainly cultural endeavors in, in, in terms of uh, uh, politics and legal theory? So he has uh, a very interesting article. Um, it's called Critique. And um, that's why when I first read this article or th this essay, I was really surprised that he was uh, very political in this text. No? And uh, he developed a kind of uh, thinking that critique is a human right and at the same time a human duty. And what he means with uh, critique as a human right, he focused on the institutional aspects of democracy. And here he comes to the question of the separation of powers. Can you explain what is critique for uh, Adorno in this, in this sense? In this um, political sense, yeah. Here you see his... Um, experience of the United States, no? uh, where you can compare it with the German political tradition. And what he said that critique in a political expression is represented by the separations of powers and the system of checks and balances. And he said that in this uh, text, he says that a democracy without these uh, separation of powers is can't be called a democracy in a, in a true sense. And that these democracies have their basis in critique and this is symbolized through the separation of powers. Otherwise, it becomes a, I don't know, an authoritarian regime where mostly the executive uh, decides where to go. And so this is uh, very important in this aspect. But because he's not so much engaged in all these political theory uh, questions, here is Franz Neumann much more engaged and um, He focused a lot on, on the individual, and here it comes, uh, a critique as a human duty. And this, he uh, elaborates on the concept of Mündigkeit, it's like in, in English it's maturity. And this is one of the main topics of um, Adorno, I would say, in a lot of his writings. How is it possible that we can still demand that every individual can take responsibility for himself and for herself. We still demand it when... How do you mean? Yeah, he, bu uh, he builds upon a Kantian version of, of uh, maturity, you know, that um, Kant developed in uh, uh, what is enlightenment, you know, that uh, the self-thinking, the self-determined uh, person. And he says, if we just do it like uh, Kant did it uh, before, it's becoming 
too ideal. It's it, a, a political. A way? political be, because it doesn't consider uh, the the social conditions, which doesn't make it easy for a single person to determine their own purpose in life. I don't know, we're living in a capitalist society, so everybody is in a way forced to earn, to earn money and you know how much pressure is on the individual. And if you're not on the lucky side and have a, a lot of money because your family is rich or something like this. So, so, so it seems that uh, um, Adorno's uh, image was unjustified to an extent because here... He actually insists on making uh, this philosophy political, and the fact that you know political politics was somewhat absent from his general, more more famous uh, uh, works, is perhaps a, a bit unfair. A little bit. There are some. Uh, uh, Shannon Mariotti um, uh, wrote a very nice uh, book about Adorno and democracy, where he, where she elaborates all the political dimension of uh, Adorno's work. And in Germany, we have a kind of tradition as well who read it like uh, him like this. He has like these two main influences. This is of course Marx, but as well Kant, and then the experience of Auschwitz, which really changed the whole focus in, in critical theory as well. Yeah. Definitely. So, where, where do you see what parallels do you see between his more famous, uh, you know, uh, work on critical theory and the political aspects of it? I mean, if if you need to like name the one or two most uh, uh, um, um, prominent uh, principles. For example, in negative dialectics, uh, he elaborates a lot on the concept of the non-identical. And um, what he tries to to focus on this is, or how he called one when he uh, when he writes in this book, what is dialectic? And he he answered this question by himself. It's a it's a thinking of the non-identical. So if you have if you uh, put it now into the other context of human rights and law issues. Is law only oppression and prohibition and control? Or is there another aspect that goes beyond this and has something that shows us something uh, of ways of more getting more freedom through institu institutional arrangements? So he doesn't really uh, say this in uh, negative dialectics. He even says in negative dialectics that law is uh, the, uh, uh, the original form of irrationality because it, he, uh, law makes everything similar, like the submission under a self-proclaimed general, how he calls it. But this is always with Adorno. He always does a profound critique and then in the next sentence he says, but... Only uh, if we have this, we have kind of ways to get out of this uh, circle of identity thinking. And yes, law is in a way a little bit identity thinking in a way that it must look away from particularities and needs to work with abstract, more uh, universal concepts to be law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a contradiction. Yeah, I want to go back to Auschwitz, as one would. Uh, you said about the, the great influence that it had on Adorno's work and also on Bienenfeld's work and many others. And, you know, they, they were the two men, I mean, other than uh, looking for similarities in the, in the thought, also the biographies are, are pretty similar, both upper middle class German-speaking Jews uh, coming of age at the turn of the 20th century and, of course, gravely affected by the collapse of the European order of the early uh, 19th, uh, 20th century. I know that it's almost a cliche to ask how they, their own biographies affected their intellectual work, but can you say something about that? Bienfeld, you, you see it very clearly because he was not really engaged in political activities and Jewish representation in Vienna before the Second World War. And he became politicized through the experience of disenfranchisement and he lost... Or maybe to say he became more Jewish. I think you're right. It's uh, He became in this sense a Jewish that he... Uh, or more Jewish that he, he became aware of the forces against uh, the Jewish people and that 
what Hannah Arendt once said in a very famous uh, sentence as well, if you are attacked as a Jew, you have to respond as a Jew. And I think this is what he experienced as well. And he's not pessimistic um, per se, but yeah, he's very down to earth and seeing what are the real possibilities and how can can something like Jewish identity in international law find its place and he tried always to reconcile this particularism with universalism. And his main answer why he developed so strongly the idea of humanity and human rights was that he was seeing that uh, or analyzing what happened with law uh, during uh, Nazi dictatorship because there were laws in, in, in Nazi Germany. It, it was not a lawless land, but it didn't have a benchmark of individual dignity and in individual security. And he was uh, always hinting on this. And even when he commented on the human rights declaration, he was always saying, we have to put more emphasis. What does law here mean? Like Nazi Germany had a lot of laws, but they excluded one big part of their own population. So we have to have a, a closer look on what is behind law. And for example, with education, he put very much uh, emphasis on this. And he always saw education as a um, mean to control aggression in society. And when they developed the right of education and the human rights declaration, he was saying, yeah, it's nice when we uh, when we say this, like we need the right to education, but we uh, to what education? We have to look, is it an uh, education to war or to cooperation? And he developed this uh, or in, in rediscovery of justice. He put very much emphasis on it in one part where he said that a person has a right to education, not to... Uh, not to be educated uh, for the purpose of war aggression. This is, was very important for him. So not only staying in abstract slogans, but to put more emphasis on the content, what these slogans should mean. What do you think is this long-lasting impact on uh, um, human rights in later years, I mean, up to today? I would say on an empirical side, he's a very marginal person. He's like, I'm not coming from the background of Jewish studies, but um, when I talk to my colleagues here and uh, at the Jacob Robinson Institute, not so many people were aware of being fed. If you go to the uh, to the archive in the uh, Central Zionist archive, you find a lot of correspondence. He was a very active person. Gerd Riegner from the World Jewish Congress in the G uh, Geneva um, office in his autobiography, he mentioned being a fat a lot and said that he was one of the most innovative thinkers in, uh, in international law and especially in human rights law. What, what do your colleagues who are uh, um, legal historians or maybe experts of, on international law say about him, if they've heard about him at all? Yeah, of course. You named James Loeffler. Of course, he, uh, he, know, uh, he mentioned him as well. And... Um, it's very interesting, like this whole section of psychoanalysis and legal theory became a marginal topic, but an interesting topic. And I think now nowadays where there's a lot of debunking of, uh, of human rights as well, like it's too abstract, it can't solve anything. His work is uh, it's modest but at the same time because it is modest yeah, and uh, focusing on key issues it can help to sharpen our view what law can do should do and uh, is able to do it's, it sounds pretty uh, uh, advanced I would say even modern to uh, do a psychoanalytical reading of uh, legal theory uh, I totally agree with you, yeah. definitely. I mean, something that I wouldn't definitely. expect someone in the 1940s yeah. to do. Definitely, but he was influenced by Vienna, no? Um, by the Vienna School. He, he, he visited classes with uh, Freud, so the 20s had a huge impact on on him as well. And but in this very specific field of psychoanalysis and, and legal theory, is he uh, a major influence? No. I, uh, I talked to friends of mine who are um, in Berlin and uh, psychoanalysis and um, the Institute of uh, Psychoanalysis. They always think that ah, it's interesting that there's people uh, that they did this, but it's not a huge field of investigation right now. I wouldn't say this. So, so how did you come across him? 
Actually, I, when I started to, um, I told you that I was interested in the human rights discourse in the f 46 and 48. I read this very famous book uh, from uh, Johannes Morsink, uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And I am a notorious footnote reader. <laughs> and um, Sometimes he, it's more interesting than the yeah, book itself. And he was quoting him on these um, three articles, asylum, right to education, and arbitrary detention. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. This person is looking a little bit behind the big concept, education. We have it now as well. Democracy is as well one big slogan, and you need to be more concrete. This is really the beauty of research, isn't it? You know, just going into a rabbit hole through uh, a footnote or two. Yeah, for me, yes. Isn't I, it? Yeah, for everyone, definitely, I yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. Anna Redman, uh, a PhD student at the Freie Universität in Berlin and a doctoral fellow at the uh, Robinson, Jacob Robinson Institute for the Study of Individual and Collective Rights at the Hebrew University. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. And many thanks to Itai Shalem, the manager of TLV1 Studios, and to the Robinson Institute for their generous support. And now we've got a request, because many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto a Patreon campaign. Check out our archive, it has probably close to a thousand interviews by now. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and most important, join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from us here in Tel Aviv, goodbye. Goodbye.